Mm-hmm. You do. You do. Good evening and welcome. I'm Linda Roseman, co-chair, along with Dan Salzman of the Brookline Neighborhood Alliance. The BNA is the umbrella organization for all of the neighborhood associations in Brookline. We are a nonpartisan group that focuses on neighborhood issues. In the past, we have co-sponsored candidates' nights, warrant article reviews for town meeting, as well as community events that are intended to inform residents about neighborhood issues. Due to COVID, like so many of you, we have been in hibernation, but we're back. And tonight we are sponsoring the first candidate night, candidates' night of the election season with the three candidates for select board who are vying for two open seats. We'd like to welcome Arden Reamer. Hi, everyone. Great to see you. John Van Skoyak. Good evening. And Paul Warren. Dan will be our moderator this evening and we'll explain the ground rules in a minute. Gina Hahn, Gina Hahn and I will be collecting questions from those of you who haven't already handed us some on the index cards that we've got out on the table in the hallway. You know, uh, many of you are asking the same questions as you can well imagine, and we might not ask your exact same question, but we will definitely make the effort to ask a question that's in the same theme as the one you might have asked a question about. Um, if you have one in the, if you're in the audience and you want us to grab an answer from you, or a question from you, just stick it up in the air and we'll come and get it. Folks watching at home were invited to submit questions by email ahead of time, so they've also had the opportunity to ask questions. We would like to thank Brookline Interactive Group for broadcasting and recording this event and for all they do and have done to promote civic engagement. Our timekeeper tonight is Lee Cook Childs, who's sitting in the front row. We thank her for her service. Uh, she's a very famous timekeeper. Um, and I'm going to ask Dan to take it away. He'll explain the ground rules and we will begin. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Uh, good evening. I'm Dan Saltzman, co-chair of the Brookline Neighborhood Alliance, as Linda just said. Uh, I want to thank the candidates for being here, thank all the people in the audience for being here and people that are watching at home. Um, I've worked with both John and Paul on various issues over the years, and I met Arden just this weekend, but I've worked with some of her closest supporters over the years. And so I have a connection to all three of these candidates. Um, if there's one thing I know, all three of these candidates care deeply about Brookline, which is really important. Um, but what will they do to put that into action, right? That's what we're here to find out tonight. Um, my job is to just facilitate that conversation. So I'm going to read the questions. I'm going to call on the candidates to answer them. Um, we're going to go through those rules in a second. Uh, you know, I think with this trio, I don't expect any fireworks and uh, you know personal attacks or anything like that, but I'm going to ask them to prove me right on that. And with that said, mm -hmm. we've got some uh, rules to follow. So the introduction... Everyone will get an introduction. It'll be three minutes and it is alphabetical by last name. But for the sharp observer, you'll notice it's also alphabetical by first name. Which is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so then when it comes to the questions, we're just going to rotate through. Every, you know, one person will get the first crack at it and then the next person and we'll just keep rotating. Um, the answers to questions will be two minutes. And then if there is a rebuttal, if necessary, uh, you can have one minute. But just remember a rebuttal is not like a second bite at the answer apple, right? A rebuttal is if something comes up that, that you can you need to address. Um, and then there'll be, at the end, you'll have three minutes for concluding remarks. And again, that'll actually be in reverse alphabetical order. Hmm. So John, you're gonna be second for both of those. I hope that's okay. Um, and with that, we're gonna get started. Any questions about the <laughs> ground rules? We're good? <clears throat> yeah, go, oh yeah, yeah. please, Lee. <laughs> got it all right are you gonna hold up a, a card lee like you have in the past is it just gonna be the sound no. all right that's okay we'll do the sounds all right so we're gonna get started uh first question what do you consider to be the greatest challenges facing brookline today and we're gonna start with uh what did i say with arden i thought we had three minute introduction oh. <laughs> three minute introductions coming up right now arden please go ahead thank you i was going to say right. the same thing all right what happened in the introduction i'm arden Beamer, candidate for select board town meeting member in precinct eight it's a privilege to speak to this group thank you brookline neighborhood alliance and an honor to be among this talented impactful group of candidates 
My family moved to Brookline in 1981. I grew up in Coolidge Corner and Chestnut Hill and felt a sense of connection to my neighborhood and optimism about the future. After college and graduate school, I returned home to Brookline to raise my own family here. During this time, I established my roots in social services and supporting underserved women and their families and advocating for women's reproductive rights and gender equality. After business school, I used my public nonprofit credentials to work in the executive office for administration and finance. I helped manage the $900 million Massachusetts public safety budget in a bipartisan government. It was an incredible view of the complexities of running our Commonwealth. It was there on Beacon Hill that I was first exposed to the challenges of balancing stakeholders' interests, the value of our dedicated public servants, and most importantly, the impact that government can have on our communities. As many of you can relate, it was my children who reignited my lifelong connection to our town. Our son and daughter entered the school formerly known as Devotion, and I got involved running the PTO and representing parents on the building committee. In 2015, my first successful campaign experience was to help pass the debt exclusion to fund the Florida Ruff and Ridley School. After reinforcing my community connections as a town meeting member in Precinct 8, I am now running for the select board because there are many goals, many goals I want to accomplish for this town I love so dearly. And I believe that my goals for Brookline are shared by most of our residents. I think my values are aligned with those who also see a bright future for our own town, and there is much work to be accomplished to get there. We have an affordability crisis on our hands in Brookline. Seniors who live here are concerned about an increase in taxes, and families who live here are being stretched too thin. On the select board, I will work with the other four members, the 255 town meeting members, and you, our community members, to problem solve our structural deficit and expand our commercial tax base. We are also facing a climate crisis, and even though this is in no way unique to Brookline, it is our responsibility to address it and meet our sustainability goals. There, these are just two of the goals I intend to accomplish if you elect me to the select board, which also include efficiencies in our departments and prudent fiscal oversight, support for our schools, and an unwavering attention to their impact on our community as a whole, evaluating our town school partnership and ensuring that all stakeholders' interests are met, and last but not least, problem solving our affordability crisis. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. John? Good evening, everybody. It really does feel good to look out and see people for a change. And uh, let me explain that a little bit. It took me uh, a lifetime, literally, to be ready to be on the select board or for the town to be ready for me to be on the select board. Let's put it that way. I, I've been in Brookline since 1975. Our kids went to all the way through the Brookline schools. I'm eternally grateful for the good education that they got there. And I'm eternally grateful to the town of Brookline and the people who have been involved in our local volunteer self-government <clears throat> for, for my, my years in the town <clears throat> and who have made Brookline, in survey after survey, one, one of the best places to live in the U.S. And I really value that. But I didn't feel ready to be on the select board until after I had been um, at town meeting for many years and then been on the advisory committee and then been an advisory committee chair. Um, and even then, it turned out I wasn't ready to be on the select board, at least in the judgment of the voters, because I ran for the office and I didn't get elected. Um, and then came a time in my career where I had to step back from politics. And then the opportunity came my way again when I retired. And I still wanted to do something significant for the town and to sit at this table and to be part of governing the town as it had been governed so well over so many years. So I tried again, and thank you very much voters um, who elected me in 2020. Um, I still have a lot to give, and I still believe that uh, Brookline is the best place, uh, 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 it's the sort of the best of all possible worlds for many of us. But we have to keep it that way, and we have to we have to honor the needs in Brookline that aren't being met. So, real quickly, I'm going to tick off what it was like in my first term, 
We dealt with COVID. We dealt with a policing crisis. We dealt with having to replace our town administrator who retired after 12 years on the job. And then vacancies opened up in department after department after department. And we had to find responsible and good leaders for those departments. We had the climate crisis that thankfully th through uh, the, the efforts of myself and others um, has actually brought Brookline to the forefront as one of the leading communities in dealing with the climate crisis. And now going forward, We've got issues of housing. We've got issues of figuring out how we're going to do overrides in the future. And I think there's a discussion of charter change, or at least a discussion of is the form of government we have still working for us the way we need it to work for us. So I love challenges. I love being part of governing. And I love communicating with all of you. And that's why I started something called the All Politics Newsletter, which I think many of you in this room read. And I, I want to have a chance to continue on that path. And thank you very much for everything that you've done that has brought me to, to this tonight. Thanks, John. Paul? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining this evening. I'm Paul Warren. Um, thank you to the, the Brookline Neighborhood Alliance for hosting this event uh, and for the other two candidates for joining. I'm looking forward to uh, a, a lively discussion about the issues. Um, my wife, Amy, and I have lived in Brookline for 12 years. Um, Amy and I both serve in town meeting. I believe she may be the only transplant surgeon in the history of town meeting to serve. Mm -hmm. um, and we have uh, two young children. Uh, I'm actually the father of five. I'm the grandfather of two, uh, with a third coming soon. And I also am a stay-at-home dad for um, two Lawrence school children, one in the third grade and one in Beep. They will both be in uh, Lawrence next year. Um, I feel that I um, am uniquely qualified to serve on the select board and to serve the residents of Brookline. Uh, I have a more than 30 year uh, business career. Um, I've helped take companies public. I've managed budgets in excess of $100 million. I've managed worldwide organizations. That seemed quick. Um, <laughs> was that too quick? <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. Um, so a seasoned executive, uh, I have, um, lived in section eight housing. I was a 17 uh, year old married at 17 years old. Uh, I had my first child at 18. If it wasn't for section eight housing, uh, I would not be sitting uh, in front of you. So I really understand the needs of, uh, under-resourced neighbors. Um, I'm an experienced public servant. I've served on the advisory committee for two years. I've been in town meeting for four years. Uh, it's been great. Um, and I'm probably one of the more active uh, members of town meeting. Um, I've also been a successful legislator uh, in town meeting. I brought uh, a number of uh, impactful Warren articles forward, um, really through collaboration. Um, I'm known for working with others, finding common ground and finding solutions. It's an area that um, I really uh, will focus on as a select board member, um, as one of five. And then finally, um, you know, I'm a, a public school parent. Um, I take my children to school every day. I pick them up. I interact with all the parents. I greatly value our teachers, educators, our staff, um, the needs of the schools and the children. So I believe that that's a unique uh, set of skills to bring to the select board, and I would be honored to serve you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, so now, you know, I was just so excited to get to these questions. Yeah. Now we can get to the questions. So thanks for those introductions. Right. Um, you heard the question. I'll say it again. Uh, what do you consider to be the greatest challenges, plural, if you need that, facing Brookline today? Arden, we'll start with you. Okay, great. Two minutes? Two minutes. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi again. Uh, so I believe that the greatest challenges that we are facing is affordability. I really think pe people are struggling to be able to afford to live in this town and be able to afford to move to this town. And, and I, that is not the Brookline that I have known. That is not the Brookline I want for our future. I want families who want to live here to be able to move here and seniors and, and other young families and, and all different kinds of families to be able to stay here. So that is something we are facing. The other thing is a structural deficit. We need to figure out a way to keep our businesses thriving, to make sure that we are looking at ways to expand our commercial tax base, 
to look at other revenue sources so that we do not need to have override after override and that we can figure out a way to help abate or help with folks who are struggling to afford their taxes as they go up and up and up year after year. And I see those as some of the biggest challenges that we are facing here in Brookline. Thank you, John. Yeah, thank you uh, for that question. And um, I'm going to talk about something which some people say, you know, uh, pe people give sort of lip service to this, but they don't really vote on the basis of this issue. I think they should vote on the basis of this issue, and that is climate change. Climate change is, is not just another issue. It's the issue. If we don't do something about it, not just in Brookline, but at the state level, national level, global level, there's no telling what the future is going to be like for our children and our children's children. We do know that, according to science, there is not, there, there is not an easy way out of this. If we don't stop burning carbon, we're, we're going to continue to go on the road towards a, more, a warming planet that is going to get warmer every year and is already um, headed towards that threshold uh, increase of of 1.5 degrees that could could lead to a spiral effect and and be the point of no return. I was I was at an event. That's that's one minute, or is that two minutes? <laughs> I'm halfway through. Thank you very much. Thank goodness. <laughs> I'm trying to save the climate here. Um, uh, I, I was at an event at uh, uh, at BIG the other night uh, and, and met a, a wonderful guy, one of our neighbors, John Mandy, um, uh, and he he uh, is quite familiar with uh, uh, Congo in Africa. Um, that's where his family is from. He started telling me about the crisis they have um, in, in a basin area that is the equivalent of the Amazon rainforest, and it's being exploited, and we it, it needs to be nourished and expanded but instead it's it's being raped you know by um p people who find profit in in uh, the resources in in that part of uh, the congo um this is impacting people everywhere um and we're trying to i think lead an effort here in brookline to show how we can step by step inch by inch address it with practical measures and we need to continue to innovate through things like ZAB. And and I'll talk more about it in a minute. I don't want to go over my time. Thanks, John. Paul? Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I agree with the other two candidates, frankly. There's a lot of issues that uh, are important, and we probably agree on um, many of them, uh, frankly. Um, I, my my background in business, 30 years in business, is I'm all about planning. Um, I'm associated with it. And I, so I believe that one of the things that's missing um, for Brookline and for leadership is looking forward. We get caught up in the day-to-day. -day. We get caught up in, in approving this and approving that and arguing over the details of things. But what's missing is a forward-looking plan. Arden touched a little bit about structural deficit. That's a forward-looking plan about how we're going to grow, where are we going to grow, and how we're going to be able to afford it. Um, in particular, I'm very concerned about affordability as well. Um, developers are not going to build subsidized income uh, uh, housing for us the type of housing that I lived in, um, unless we make them do it. So I think we need a plan to uh, address affordability specifically. But I want to touch on one, one subject that seems to be ignored over and over, and that's our seniors. Um, about 20% of our population are seniors, aging adults, and it's growing. It's, it's estimated to be 25 to 30% uh, in, in the future. We spend one quarter of 1% of our budget supporting aging adults in Brookline. And I think that that's uh, worrisome. The needs of our seniors are significant. Um, the habits of our seniors due to COVID uh, has changed significantly. They're, they're now remote and isolated. And I believe that we need to uh, readdress our planning for seniors, look at their needs, figure out how we're going to support them going forward, and develop an action plan and funding to be able to do that. So I think that's an important part of my plan. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay, we're going to move, I think, to the second question. There's no rebuttals necessary, right? Um, so where do you stand on ballot question three, which keeps our current limit of four marijuana retail stores in place? And we're going to start with John on that one. Oh, thank you very much. Um, 
There's an issue involved in, in question three that I, I, I choose not to ignore. Um, and that is the, the issue of social equity. Um, when I arrived on the select board, uh, the wheels had already been set in motion and it was unfortunately too late to change what happened in, in the issuing of the first four licenses that we issued in Brookline. And those four licenses by order of the state, basically, uh, went to the first four people who got in line for the licenses. This is for retail marijuana, retail cannabis. Um, surprise, surprise, the first four to get in line were the most resourced people with um, connections uh, and who were themselves um, uh, you know, already, already tied into the resources that they would need to raise the money and happened to be white. Nothing wrong with that. But by far the great majority of the victims of criminalization of drugs in this country and, and of the laws regarding cannabis um, are non-white. And there was a thought, you know, um, thank goodness, some people were thinking about if we're going to legalize it, shouldn't we share the benefits of legalization with non-white communities? And offering them licenses to, retail, to have retail cannabis operations was the obvious way to do it. The cap will keep in place the four licenses we've already granted, none of which went to what they call now social equity applicants. There's gonna be a vote tomorrow on the select board, please watch, on a social equity policy. We won't be able to execute on our social equity policy and maybe find a couple of occasions where small operations can be licensed to non-white um, operators um, if we, we are stuck with our four licenses, which a yes vote on question three would cause us to be. So I'm a no vote on question three, and I hope people will listen to the social equity argument, and maybe they'll decide to be a no vote on question three as well. Thanks, John. Paul? Yes, thank you. Um, it's a great question. So when, when the voters approved uh, the decriminalization of cannabis, marijuana, um, you know, there was really no data. Um, we hadn't studied uh, cannabis, uh, the effects of cannabis. Um, and since the time that we, uh, we voted to approve it, there's a growing body of evidence that, um, that cannabis, and the cannabis today is much different than the cannabis that you were smoking in the 60s or the 70s. It's, it's, it's very, very potent, um, uh, and, and it's, it's having an effect. And so there's a growing body of data that uh, is, is indicating that cannabis has a, a profound effect on the developing mind. And so um, I, I support uh, capping at four. Um, I, I, I specifically support asking the voters to make this decision as opposed to town meeting. So I'm, I'm happy that, uh, that the question is being put before the voters, but I really do want to center our policies around uh, protecting and taking care of our youth. Um, and I do want to say this, I don't understand why we would limit economic opportunity for, uh, for our black and brown neighbors to just cannabis. Why don't we expand our entire commercial opportunity? Coffee shops, card shops, restaurants, plumbers, uh, you name it, and provide an opportunity to waive fees, uh, expedite licensing, um, you know, create opportunities for mentorship to start businesses, why limit it to just cannabis? I think that we should provide opportunities across our entire economic spectrum. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Arden? Well, I want to thank both John and Paul because I think they've covered equal opposite ends of the spectrum when it comes to capping marijuana. But I want to say that, first of all, I agree with what Paul said, that absolutely it should go to the voters. I mean, this is a democracy. We in Brookline love to vote. We're going to do it on May 2nd. So I absolutely do think that it should go to the voters. And I think that was the right call. But I also want to talk about two very good friends of mine that are in the audience. That's Susan Park and Wadner Oge. And I know them from the Ruffin Ridley School. We've been together for years and we both have teenagers and middle school students. And marijuana use starts in the middle schools. I saw it across the street from my house during the pandemic. They're doing it all over. I mean, it is, it is there. 
it's around. And so when Susan came to me and presented the science to me, her husband is a doctor, I listened to her. And the science scares me about how it impacts the youth brain. And that's what I'm thinking about because even though retail marijuana is not sold to our children, it is still available to them. And so when, when Wadner and Susan come to me and they say, look, this is what happens. This is what, this is what happens this is ha when when marijuana is available and 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 flooding are available on the market i listened to them and when they came to me and said look we need to bring this to the voters i listened to them so i want to thank them for their support and for their information on this and in the end the voters will decide you all will decide what the right and what the what the right answer is for capping marijuana thank you Thanks, um, Arden. Uh, Paul, you, you have... mind if I ask? I, would, I did want to make one rebuttal. <laughs> okay. I think yep. I had my, my hand up first. Um, yeah. Sorry, sir, uh, sorry John. I've... No, no, that's fine. <laughs> please, please, please. I, I'm sorry. Um, I did want to make one point, and I, I, I think in Arden's statements, something that's very important to make clear: um, a capping uh, cannabis at four licenses is only affecting retail cannabis. There are still all the delivery licenses that would be available and also uh, social consumption, which is not approved yet by town meeting, but could be approved by town meeting. So we're really just talking about capping only retail cannabis licenses to four, not the others. There's still tremendous opportunity in the, can the cannabis industry in Brookline to, uh, to allocate uh, licenses to BIPOC uh, and minorities in Brookline before uh, considering other applicants. Thank you. John? Uh, yeah, Paul makes a good point, but um, we, we have some some friends in Brookline, and we, we all know uh, some of the town meeting members. I think you'll recognize this name, Donnell O'Neill. Uh, Donnell referred to the, the licenses that are not the retail licenses as crumbs, and I, t I take his word for it that it's not the same thing to be offered a delivery license as it is to be allowed equal opportunity, equal opportunity to have access to operating a retail establishment. Um, and that's all this is about. It's, it's about making sure that we don't foreclose. Danelle the other night referred to it as killing a dream. And I, I think in a way it is. If you suddenly learn that your own townspeople don't think you should have the same opportunity that the first four white, well-resourced, operators had to get licenses, that feels like killing a dream. And I wanted to add one last thing, which is I didn't really hear Arden say yes or no, whether she would vote yes or no on uh, question three. I thought that was the question. Arden, would you like to respond to that? Absolutely. Um, I think I, I thought I thought I made it very clear that I will vote in support of of my friends, Susan and Wadner. Oh, and good. Maybe I didn't hear. Thank you. Okay, question number three. Uh, and Paul, you're gonna go first here. Okay. Um, what is your position on the MBTA Communities Act and the proposed rezoning of Harvard Street? <clears throat> Should Brookline comply with the act? And if so, how? Sure, so this is a, a very complex and uh, contentious topic for sure. Um, I, I have two minutes or three minutes, <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> Let's start with two, we'll see how that goes. Okay, so uh, this is my view uh, and it's an executive view. Uh, it, as if, if I were sitting on the select board today, um, I would have voted exactly the way that John voted and, and the rest of the select board to move forward with the planning process to also at the same time, because we need to comply with the law. Bro Brookline should not be violating the law. The law says we need to do, we need to have a plan in place. Um, at the same time, we need to do our darndest to go work with the, um, with the agency that oversees the, the guidelines and ask them to make exception for our uniqueness. And that's Commercial Street, uh, um, uh, the, the first floor commercial. Uh, the, the zoning uh, guidelines don't allow us to require that. Um, but here's, here's what I would really be doing on the select board. And I, I hope to have this chance uh, before that, because this will come up in November. This has to pass a two thirds vote at town meeting. I believe it's incumbent upon the leadership of this town, the executive board, the select board, to provide as many options to town meeting to comply with the law. Right now, the select board is only bringing one option, the Harvard Street Corridor. And we need to provide many options and solutions to town meeting as possible so that town meeting can make a right choice for Brookline to allow us to comply with the law. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. 
Um, next, we have Arden. Thank you. So I agree with Paul that we absolutely need to comply with the law, but, and I make a big but, we need to advocate with the Department of Housing and Community Development, I think that's who you're referring to, yes. with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to make sure that the guidelines that they have handed down to us for compliance fit with the unique um, community and neighborhoods of Brookline. So that is going to be a very important part of this next part of the process when we talk about complying by December 2023 or the vote at November town meeting. So th the other part that, and Paul touched on this, is about building consensus. If we are your executives on the select board, we are your leaders. And so we need to make sure that you, that we are listening to you and hearing what you want, that you're getting what you want out of complying with the MBTA Communities Act. And that is the critical part. And the planning department is doing a wonderful job of, or they're trying to do their best job of informing you of the decision they've made. And they're trying to get information to you. I've gone on a walking tour with Maria Morelli in my neighborhood. I'm actually a town meeting member in precinct eight. So it very much impacts us. We're right along Harvard street. And we have, we're able to, she was able to take us out and show us what form-based zoning looks like, what it would mean for our neighborhood. All, many of my neighbors were there and we did this together as a group. And this is the key. This is the key is that you all are getting the information that you need and that you all are giving input on what you think needs to happen before your representative town meeting votes on it in November. And as the select board, we or they need to be your leaders, your executives who help you build consensus, consensus and help you to understand exactly what's going on so that we make the right decision together. Thank you, John. Thank you very much for the question. And uh, I have to say this uh, particular issue is one of the best examples I've seen in a long time of how public policy um, can be so difficult in the working out of it um, in, in practice. So what we have now is a planning department that is extremely capable and working in all good faith to comply with guidelines that, that are been, have been added by the DHCD to a piece of legislation that was adopted by the legislature when even people from the legislature, including our own representative, Tommy Vitolo, say, oh, he's back there. Hey, Tommy, um, say that the guidelines do not fit well with Brookline in some respects and need to be negotiated and changed, if at all possible. The second thing that we have to contend with is, and this is why groups like Brookline by Design are watching so carefully, and they have endorsed me, by the way. Um, I think they endorsed Paul, too. Indeed. Um, because they know that bad uh, policy, bad housing policy, can result in unintended consequences. And one thing that I think we can all agree on if we walk up and down Harvard Street is that we have something really special there. I happen to really love all of the, all of the shops, and I love them because they're they're, many of them are one of a kind. They're small, but they're thriving. They're thriving at a time when they just had to, they just had to survive COVID, but they're thriving. I don't want to do anything, and I don't want to see anything done by mandate of the state that is going to cause any of those retail establishments to, to lose their businesses in Brookline because they didn't fit in with the vision of taking single-story retail and turning it into single-story retail with two or three or four um, levels of housing. And I'm not sure we've figured out the, the formula yet that allows retail to thrive in things like we have these low one-story blocks. Um, and sometimes in these brand new 40B developments, you'll see vacant retail on the first floor. We gotta figure that out before we continue to um, mess further with the formula, whatever it is that makes Harvard Street work. Thank you. Does anybody have a rebuttal? Yeah. Arden, go ahead. I just wanted to say that no one here has mentioned how it impacts climate crisis. And part of the MBTA Communities Act is building in climate and excuse me, in transportation accessible areas. 
And that is a big part of when we think about, John brought up um, the climate crisis earlier and how that is the number one issue we're facing in Brookline. So when we think about where we want to live, where we want to shop, right, where we want to do our business and where we we need to take transportation from, we want to keep it in our commercial centers. And I think addressing the climate crisis is very is one of the key issues we're facing here in Brookline. And that absolutely applies to our housing and our zoning and where we do our, our building. Thank you. Okay. Paul, go ahead. Yeah, one, one point um, following up on, on Arden. Thank you, Arden. Um, the thing that the three of us have not mentioned, which I think is probably the, one of the most important issues of whatever we come up with, is the increase in income restricted housing in Brookline. Um, you know, this is a once in a generation opportunity to increase how much housing is income restricted. When I say income restricted, I'm talking 50% of area median income, 80% of area median income. Um, you know, I, our current inclusionary zoning um, is not adequate. It does not allow us to create enough income restricted housing to have firefighters live in Brookline or teachers live in Brookline or police officers live in Brookline. Um, and, and we absolutely need to change that. Um, and so I'm really hoping that um, whatever gets brought to town meeting, that there is a significant component of income restricted housing so that we can have seniors that want to age in place remain in Brookline. Uh, that we have teachers and firefighters and others that want to come uh, into our community and participate. And frankly, uh, talking about the climate crisis, um, one of the best ways to reduce the impact that uh, cars and, and carbon have on the environment is to be able to live near transportation. And unfortunately, low-income people are usually relegated to areas without trees. They're usually relegated to areas with the worst uh, air quality. Uh, they're in flood zones. And we have to get very intentional and making sure that developers build what we not want, not what they want. Thank you. John, would you like to say something? No, or I just as a, no, 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 I'm fine. In fairness, <laughs> they took their amenities. Okay. All right, fine. Okay. Thank you for asking. Sure. Um, all right, we will go to question number four now. Um, and this is going to be, uh, Arden, you'll answer first. Okay. Um, what is your position on the Pierce School override? Oh. Well, thank you, Dan, for <laughs> asking that. I don't know if anyone noticed here that I'm wearing my yes for Brookline pin. So I, this is how I look at supporting the debt exclusion for the Pierce School. So as I mentioned earlier, my kids went through the Ruffin Ridley School. And back in 2014, I supported the debt exclusion for, uh, to rebuild the, the devotion school, as it was called at the time. And then they had the experience of going to this beautiful, incredibly um, hand, ADA compliant, state-of-the-art school for many, many years. And then my son, and he was at Old Lincoln a couple of times, and then, and then my son went to Brookline High. And by then, 22 Tappan was finished, and he was in a beautiful, again, ADA-compliant, state-of-the-art building over at 22 Tappan. And so my kids have had the experience of going to these incredible schools, school buildings. All our schools are incredible. The teachers are amazing. That's that. That is a given, and we're so grateful to them. But these incredible state-of-the-art buildings, handicap compliant, and a, and a wonderful experience with that. However, my friends whose kids are at the Pierce School are not, are not in any way having that same experience here in Brookline. I went on a tour of the Pierce School, and if you haven't gone on one, I, I recommend that you do. And when I was in there, it had rained the day before, and there was a huge puddle in the middle of the auditorium. I mean, a big puddle on the floor of the auditorium. And this is, as I understand it, is the last building, last part of the building that they'd actually renovated. And it was a disaster. And I found out that children who have broken a leg or are in wheelchairs need to be carried up to their classrooms. The only handicap accessible entrance is in the basement, but the, the, but the classrooms are up on the second and the third floors. This is in no way educational equity. And that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about educational equity here in Brookline. And that is the reason that I support the Pierce debt exclusion. Thank you. Thanks, Arden. John? Thanks very much, Dan. Um, as sometimes is the case, um, I'm, I'm the person who's going to give you the other point of view on this. But I do that with all respect to the yes folks and to um, th those who um, 
have made the case for uh, voting yes on Pierce. There is no question but that Pierce should be a handicapped accessible school in the same way that every other school is in Brookline and as much state of the art as possible. But we've already shown that we can build new four section handicapped accessible state of the art schools for something approaching half the, the total cost of the Pierce project. Pierce project is a $212 million project. The amount of the borrowing for Brookline will be 174 million. Um, 212 million compared to around 115 million for the brand new Driscoll, state of the art, handicapped accessible. Pierce is 50 years old. Every school that we've ever said is at the end of its life and has to be replaced with a demolition and a completely new rebuild. Was that one or two? I'm always losing one. track. Well, that was one, thank you. Um, uh, ha has been way more than 50 years old, 70 years old, 80 years old. We recently added at a cost of $86 a square foot, the most expensive flooring you could imagine to the Driscoll School. Do you know what the argument was that convinced people it was worth adding? It lasts 80 years. Well, if you demolish your school buildings after 50 years, it doesn't matter that, you, you know, the life expectancy of the materials you're putting, you're putting in them at $86 a square foot is 80 years. We, we, we know that buildings are not built to be demolished every 50 years, and we know that we can't have a school building program that rotates schools in and out every 50 years. And we know that we can build state-of-the-art handicap accessible schools for approximately half the cost of uh, building this new Pierce School. We need to, the voters are the only hope at this point of saying no because a consensus developed among the um, school leadership and the, and the uh, municipal leadership that this had to be done. This had to be done. Well, I, I, I beg to differ. I think we, the voters might want to say no, give us a pause, take another look at it, figure out how we can do it for, the, for a price that is within the range of the other schools we've built. Thanks, John. Paul? Well, that's a big question. Um, first, I want to highlight this. Today, many of you got this letter from me, my beautiful family. Oh, it's over here, this way. Um, and on it is my phone number. My phone has been ringing off the hook. That's what happens when you put your phone number on a letter to the mm -hmm. voters. Um, and I want to tell you a story. I got a, I got a phone call from um, a, 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 a retired person senior. Uh, she's lived in Brookline for a very, very long time. She's a real estate broker, um, successful, but um, she's now retired. And she was concerned about the costs of the Pierce School. And she said, what's your position on it? And I said, well, let me tell you a story. And I hope the bell won't go so quick. <laughs> An Irish, I tell stories. Um, so I grew up in Arlington. I, uh, Arlington had a school called the Audison Middle School, it, Arlington Junior High School, actually. It was seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. I went to that school. Um, today, I probably would be, if I was a kid today, I would be diagnosed with ADHD and probably on an IEP. That school was another disaster for my educational experience. It was an open concept school, just like the Pierce School. The open concept theory of education was a complete disastrous test on our young children. Um, and that school, Arlington, saw fit to tear it down and rebuild a school. Um, I went through the Pierce School on a tour. I, I, uh, full disclosure, Amy and I are, used to live in the Pierce School uh, school district. We would have went. We would have ha have been in that school. We would not have sent our children to that school. Um, when we went on the tour, all the things that Arden said. This school is where. Um, uh, children that uh, have hearing issues can't attend the school. These are wide open classrooms. Um, it's, it, I can't imagine anything. Uh, uh, I know that the teachers have done an amazing job because we've had some good schools. Um, the ADA compliance issues uh, to modify that building is extremely expensive and you're going to get less space. So, you know, I, it, I, I have a lot of respect for John standing his ground in this position. Um, I respect him for it. But frankly, I think the last hope for the children in the Pierce School District to get a quality equitable education is in the hands of the voters, not to save a few bucks on taxes. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have anything to follow up with? Good. All right, question number five. 
And we're going to start out with uh, John on this one. Um, what will you do to address concerns about racism in Brookline? Wow, that's heavy. Um, I think we're making some some progress in ways that people might not be fully aware of. And a good thing happened a, as a result of, of ARPA, the uh, American Recovery. Well, <laughs> I better get this right, right? <laughs> Somebody help me. <laughs> Recovery, something, uh, X, act. Um, Rescue Plan. Rescue Plan Act. Thank you very much, Paul. Like yeah, that. yeah, yeah, exactly. Send me a lifeline. Um, uh, our, our, ARPA came our way as a result of COVID. Uh, and the next thing we knew, in an unprecedented way, um, we are faced with a, about $40 million worth of money, which our prior town administrator, Mel Kleckner, made the decision should go in significant part to community groups. And one of the community groups that sprang up is something called um, the Black and Brown Club. But they're just one example. Um, th through, through the Brookline Community Foundation, through groups that sprang up like the Black and Brown Club, um, through traditional groups like Steps to Success, we began to realize there's a lot more we can do for um, non-white communities, and there are a lot of needs that have been left unaddressed. I, I think racism is, is, is largely an issue uh, where you prove, you prove your value uh, towards that issue by proving that you can actually make a difference in the lives of people. And I hope that through this uh, ARPA process, through the uh, emergence of groups that we didn't have before, but also through the continued and expanded service of, of groups like the Teen Center, Steps to Success, um, we're going to actually begin doing some things uh, that we haven't done before and opening up some conversations that we haven't ha opened up before. And um, I think that'll be a, a lot more significant in the long run. Um, than, um, you know, sit, sit, sitting down to sort of ha have a, a, you know, heart to heart talk with each other about our racism. I want to see us get things done. And I think um, that 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 holds some promise of actually getting some things done. Thanks, John. Paul. Yeah, thank you, um, John. I, I appreciate your words on that. Um, the this is a complicated issue. If you haven't um, taken Harvard's implicit bias test yet, I would strongly encourage you to do that. Uh, it is incredibly informative. We all have a bias. We have implicit bias. Uh, it's kind of genetically the way I think we were, if they explain it, you know, the humans were made. Uh, it's social, it's a social issue, a social construct. But, um, you know, it's, it's critical that our actions um, and uh, follow our words. So, as John said, we need to do uh, put things into place that address racism where it is. Um, how that manifests its, itself for me is I believe that our housing policy um, can address that specifically. I'm going to go back to uh, income restricted housing. It's where I came from, so it's what I know. Um, you know, if we want to increase the diversity of our population, of our community, if we want to change the faces that are around us, and the people that we interact with, we need to invite them to Brookline. We need to do that through our housing policies to make it affordable. And we certainly need to be a welcoming community. We need to speak about Brookline in a way that's welcoming. Today, we don't. I actually think we, you know, if I, given some of the things that have been going on, um, why would you want to come to Brookline? There's some issues that we've been speaking, have very difficult conversations. I think we need to become much more welcoming. I also believe we need to work aggressively to close the achievement gap in our schools. Um, you know, I'm really impressed with Paul Epstein and the work that he's doing at the Teen Center. Um, but you know, once once uh, BIPOC go through the school system, a lot of them are in BH house, BHA housing. We lose track, um, and they're not going to college. You know, we're not helping them get into the trades. And I think we really need to get very intentional in assisting and lifting up our youth um, that are within our community and help them achieve um, uh, so that they can also lead productive. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Arden? Oh, boy. How do we start to solve the problem of racism? Because we are only starting. What we need to think about, or what I believe we need to think about, 
is access and equity. We need to make sure that our BIPOC people of color have access to resources. We need to make sure that we have policies that support them, that enable them to have access to resources and that enable them for, to, be, to live in Brookline in an affordable way. The policies can start with things like zoning. Zoning goes way back to the experience of redlining and it still exists today. We need to work on our zoning laws. We need to work on our affordable housing so that we can make Brookline affordable for all of our families. And we need to talk about early childhood education because Paul is exactly right. We need to have early childhood education available. And how do we do this? Well, I was talking to my friend, Mike Sandman, who is on the select board, and we need to look at how we are licensing our child care operators. Because right now, our child care operators, and this is like daycare, nursery schools, do not take vouchers. We need to make sure that if we are giving them licenses here in Brookline, that they are going to take the vouchers from our state so that families who need help can get free early childhood education. And I was just out campaigning with my friend Marissa, who is in the back there, and she was congratulating Suzanne Fetterspiel, who's on our school committee, because we are going to have all day beep early childhood education here in Brookline starting in 2024. And then you know what else, what point she raised afterwards? She said, we need free child care, care here. We need free BEEP because they have it in Boston and they have it in Cambridge and we need it here in Brookline too. And that's how we provide access and equity and we begin to address that problem of racism. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dan. I just wanted to follow up and, and uh, amplify uh, something that Arden just said. Um, when, as I said, I, at 17, I was a husband and a father. I was on Section 8 housing. It was it, what enabled me to go to school. Um, but a very critical component of me being able to go to school full time in college was child care. We, th this voucher issue is a significant, significant issue within Brookline. Vina Priestley and I have had lengthy conversations about this. And the fact that the voucher that is given needs to have a certain certification by the, the, the care provider, um, and we do not require it. I'm not sure. We have to check to see if it's legal, first of all. But I think it's really an important path to be able to provide child care uh, so that individuals can go to work. Uh, you know, be able to go to school if that's what, what they want to do and be able to help lift themselves um, out of the situation that, that they find themselves in if they do want to go to school. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, John. Uh, just an observation, I guess. Um, that's what it is. Um, it, it's so often the case in Brookline that something happens, uh, such as the answers that we just gave to that question, and we kind of lose sight of the fact that I don't know. It looks to me like maybe it's it's three white people deciding what needs to be done about racism. I think the number one thing that needs to be done about racism, and I'm not saying that it was you know our decision to set it up this way, but we've got to get um, outside our own heads and um, inside the heads of people who are who are living the experience, and they have to be more present at occasions like this and speaking up from positions um, on, on elected commissions, elected boards, as town meeting members. Uh, and I think that begins with uh, showing them good faith effort to listen when they talk. And when they talked and said that the cap on the, on the cannabis licenses was gonna be harmful to their community, I listened. I hope the voters listened. And I, and, I, and I hope that shows up in the results on question three, because all of the talk isn't going to mean anything if we're, if we're not also listening. Thanks, John. Arden, did you have anything to, to follow up with? I'm all set. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so as a, it's a little bit of a segue, I think, into the next question, which is there are all these competing interests. And, you know, we're here and uh, they've come out tonight. We're talking about schools and child care and all these things. If we can't pay for some of that, if we can't pay for a lot of that, what, what do we do about that? What do we do about this conflict between a limited budget and all these ideas and things that we would like to do? 
whether it's a swimming pool or childcare or an ice rink or a school, how do we pay for this stuff? And what do we do if we can't? Oh, and <laughs> six, Dr. Paul. <laughs> Okay, um, that, that is a great question. Well, first, I, I firmly believe that we need to live within our means. Um, you know, we can't spend what we don't have. And in town meeting, we're famous for passing warrant articles and resolutions that are unfunded mandates to do stuff. Um, aspirational, but, um, you know, we, we don't have the money. Um, there's two things that I believe we need to do. The first is we need to uh, prioritize the money that we have with the help of the community. Um, that means inviting the community into the process of setting the budget uh, from the beginning. And I believe that there may need to be some rebalancing of, of certain items within the budget um, to deal with some, some, some varying priorities. You, you'll hear the term, I think, uh, um, the BFAC, the, the Financial Advisory Committee, uh, had recommended that we do zero-based budgeting. I'm not sure if we need to do zero-based budgeting, but we certainly do need to take uh, a realistic view of where we're spending our money and what we're getting the return on. I don't believe in business, um, you know, I, I help run a public company. We had, we had a, something called a balanced scorecard. You know, we had indicators that helped us understand um, what was the outcome that we were getting for our money. Um, so that's the, the first thing. I think we need to do a much better job at looking at how we're spending and what we're getting for it in return. The second thing is we need to do long range planning. We need to determine how we're going, how the uh, town is going to grow, where it's going to grow, and what is the net impact on our budget and how we're going to plan for that. That could mean, uh, you know, a system of operating overrides. I don't know uh, what that may look like in the future, or it may mean we need to move some around, money around to different things. But we certainly just can't keep expanding the budget without the ability to raise revenue. And I think uh, it's dramatically increasing the commercial space the commercial revenue within Brookline is something that we, we need to do aggressively to help alleviate the growth in uh, residential taxes. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Arden? Uh, thank you. So I'm going to start with revenues first, because those are critical. And I have some very talented colleagues on Precinct 8 Town Meeting, Mike Toffel and Alec Leibovitz. And right now, they wrote a, a warrant article, actually a moderator's committee, to form a group to look at our payment in lieu of taxes pilot, because that was not transparent enough. And this is where we collect taxes on nonprofits. And we have some very affluent and very large nonprofits here in Brookline, the hospitals, the universities, schools, several of them. And we didn't know what they were paying us. And so they created a committee and they looked at that. And by understanding who is paying us payment in lieu of taxes, they can go out and they can reach out to other nonprofits who are not paying us and collect additional revenues from these nonprofits. We are also have the Community Preservation Act. Finally, we are going to start receiving revenues from the Community Preservation Act. And even though those are very specific areas where we can spend them, it helps offset our budget. So that is key too. But Paul is absolutely right. We do need to look at expanding our commercial tax base. Absolutely. Janice Kahn, one of our esteemed town meeting members, was speaking to us about some properties down on Boylston Street on Route 9, some office space, and we need to look at the, at the development of those properties, and it's time to start thinking about where we can expand our commercial tax base. And then also, before I'm done, we need to talk about expenses, and this is key. So one of the things we need to look at as a select board with our different departments and as the advisory committee is where can we find efficiencies? We don't have any fat. We're not a, a fat intensive town. This is a municipality, but we can always find efficiencies. And that's one of the things we need to ask our departments when they come before us and they present their budget to us every spring as they are doing now with the select board. We need to ask them, how can you be more efficient? Thank you. Thank you, John. You know, uh, it, it's up to the voters as to whether I'm going to have another term in office, but I made the decision regardless of uh, how that turns out that I'm going to spend the remaining time I have on the select board um, just kind of leveling with people. And pilot payments aren't going to solve the problem of the structural deficit. Um, pilot payments, you know, we could we could get them a little bit higher, maybe, maybe, but um, until the law changes that says nonprofits are not tax exempt, 
Um, you're always going to start every negotiation at a disadvantage. They don't have to pay us anything. And so they, they pay us, you know, a fraction. Um, and, and it's going to be that way until the law changes. Um, but, you know, pu pu putting it out there, on, you know, and publicizing the, the amounts they pay, that's fine. I'm all for it. But it's not going to solve that problem. Building schools at a cost of twice, twice the last school that we built is not the way to have money to do uh, an indoor-outdoor skating rink at Lars Anderson or to have the money to do a swimming pool complex or to have the money to build the next school if, if our enrollment suddenly increases again. Um, we have to spend money as though we, we've given a thought to what we're going to be spending money on next. And that's one of my problems with the way that the, um, the Pierce Project has been pl planned. Um, $212 million for a school, 174 to be borrowed for it, doesn't leave much room for the next project, but we're going to have next projects. Um, and the other thing I want to say you about- wrap, wrap it up, John, okay. Uh, was that the end or the, was that the minute? <laughs> Oh, that, that was, was the minute. Scary. It was the double that got me. I'm learning. I apologize. I'm learning. <laughs> that was just the minute. <laughs> um, Sorry about that. Yeah. No, that's fine, Dan. Um, uh, where over where overrides are concerned right now, and that's overrides as as uh, distinguished from uh, debt exclusions. Um, we're we're doing them now on kind of an ad hoc basis. We don't have any standards set up as to what are the circumstances that justify an override. And what are the circumstances that don't? And I think we've got to start putting in place so that voters will have the confidence in, in the next override that we ask for, um, that we know what our, we know what our standards are. Um, if, if inflation is low, are we still gonna ask for an override? If the positions that were added to the budget were positions we said we wouldn't keep because they were grant funded, but now all of a sudden they're, they're, they're buried in the budget, are we still going to have an override? We've got to answer questions like that before we keep going back and back and back to the voters for overrides. Thanks, John. Paul, do you have something to say? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on um, John's point um, that, about how the overrides are being done. Um, you know, BFAC issued a report, I don't know, John, two years ago, three years ago, uh, calling for uh, a, a, a long term planning committee to be developed. And that planning committee would uh, look at long range revenue, long range expenses, long range capital investments. Um, and from that, they would develop a plan, which could include, you know, best case scenario for increasing revenue, but also uh, a, a operating override plan. I think it's incumbent on us to, as the select board or the executives of the town to provide visibility to the voters as much as possible about what's coming. Now, the exi I, I, I have a lot of respect for the select board and the members on it, but they haven't done this. They have not done the long range planning. In fact, the override that's in front of you, the operating override was done ad hoc. It wasn't done through a study. So with all the respect uh, to John, and I'm glad he's, he's, he's speaking straight. Um, I think it's critical and it's important that we just come to grips that we need to have a plan and we need to be looking forward as to how the town is going to grow and what we're going to need in order to be able to operate it. Because costs are growing at five to 6% and our revenue is growing at two and a half percent. You know, that doesn't work. So we need to find a way to balance that out. Thanks, Paul. John, did you have something to say? Yeah, I I'm, I'm just want to be sure that Arden's had a fair shot. Uh, have you? No, I didn't get a chance. To... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Arden, go ahead. Thank you. I agree with Paul that we definitely need to follow BFAC, the Brookline Financial Advisory Committee recommendations. Absolutely. And I do need to think that we need to come up with a plan, but I also think we need to listen to our economic development board and we need to come up with a plan for our economic development as well. And that means looking at additional commercial spaces and where we can build commercial buildings that are right for Brookline but they can help increase our commercial tax base. We have got to expand our commercial tax base. So we need a plan for our economic development as well. Thank you. Thank you.
John? Yeah, what I wanted to add, and, and Paul and I really don't disagree on this. Um, uh, it, 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 this override, which I'm going to vote for, is ad hoc. Um, it doesn't tell you the real reason that we, we have to go back to you for more money. The, the real reason is that we have these budget busting parts of the budget that have been growing faster than everything else. And they're eating up the, uh, the amount of money that we might have for our basic services, like schools and like police and fire and libraries and so on. And, and, and those big budget busters are things like uh, pay, paying off the unfunded pension liability, um, pay, paying the debt and uh, the interest on the debt um, for all of the borrowing that we're doing, um, and, and paying for group health care and retirement for our employees. Those are all good things, but they're growing at a rate of seven, eight, nine percent. And uh, you, you might notice that that's a that's a factor of two or three uh, times two and a half percent, which is the cap on, on our revenues. So that's the reason that we have this structural deficit. Unfortunately, what, what we didn't do is, given that, make sure that we don't add a lot of positions to the budget without any explanation of why we're adding positions to the budget. And I put out the information, myself, research, and in my newsletter, that we had added 14 positions since the last time we had an override. And yet we're not saying what we're going to do about those added positions. And is that the reason that we're asking for more money? Um, and why did we have to add them? And did, did we actually thoroughly determine that we need to add that many positions after an override, forcing us into having another override? So I think we've got to, we've got to kind of level with people about what's going on on the payroll, but also on what the real cause of the pressure on our budgets is, um, because those three factors are far and away the three biggest factors that force us into these overrides. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah just a quick, a quick follow-up if I can. Oh, oh sorry. No, no, you, you go on. I'd like to as well. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. If you could, yeah, just where, I think we're on like the sort of second round of models oh, here, sorry. but no, go ahead. Go, go, I think it's- Important topic. Important topic, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Just keep, as short as you can. I, mm -hmm. I just wanted to say that I've actually heard John talk about the additional FTEs at select board meetings. But those new hires did not all come between last year and this year. They were over the span of several years. And the select board voted on that budget and voted to approve that budget that had those additional FTEs. So I just want to point that out that he, that John, and thank you for your service on the select board, but, and thank you for your, for approving our budgets for our town, but those budgets were approved by the select board year after year with those additional FTEs. I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Paul. Uh, thank you. Um, and I'll just take a minute and this, I'm not uh, challenging anybody on their opinion at this point. I just want to raise something important. I'm not going to blame, um, you know, we right now, Brook, we need to reestablish Brookline as a destination employer. That means people want to come and work here. Right now, people are leaving in droves. Our police department is, they have 30 positions that are vacant, 30 positions. Um, we have a similar issue beginning to happen on the, the, the firefighter side. Uh, I met with the municipal employees union, by the way, I've endorsed by the firefighters and police, the unions. And the reason why is because I, I, I said to them that, I wanted to have Brookline be a place where people wanted to work again. And right now they don't want to work here. And there's, there, we have to ask why. One of the reasons is compensation. We're paying much lower than uh, the, the communities around us. And since you can't live here because it's so expensive, um, I spoke to 50 firefighters about a month ago and I asked them to raise their hand. Four hands went up as to who lived in Brookline. Four firefighters out of that group live in Brookline. We have to ask ourselves, why are our employees leaving? And we need to solve that problem. One of them is compensation. So the budget busters may be OPEBs and things like that uh, and interest, but we have to reconcile. What kind of community do we want to be? Do we want to pay our employees a fair living wage where they can feel good about coming to work each day, that they're being treated fairly and respectfully by their bosses? that they have opportunities for growth in their careers and that they're being paid fairly. I can tell you on those three things, they don't feel that today because I've spoken to 
all of the unions in Brookline, and they're very, very dissatisfied with how Brookline is treating their employees. We need to fix that. If this was a business, the board of directors would say, Paul, to you CEO, could, fix it. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. No, sorry. I'm sorry. I appreciate it. John, did you, I'll, I'll yeah. give you the last word. On yeah, this. yeah, I'm sorry. Just, I just want to say a couple of things. And, and I, I, Arden raises a fair point. Um, you know, I, I'm not proud of the fact that it took me until my third year on the select board to wake up to the fact that we were adopting budgets year in and year out. And it, 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 it creeps up on you. It's like two positions and then three and then four and then three and then four. And before you know it, and, and, and it, is, it isn't in the last year, it's, as I said, it's since the last override that we've added these 14 positions. I'd like to get a little bit of credit for the person waking everybody up to this fact, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe a little bit late to the game, but that's the kind of, of study that I do of budgets to try to figure out what's not obvious about this budget. And believe you me, you can read that budget and it goes on for hundreds of pages. It's not obvious that what's going on in that budget is that over the past four or five budgets, we've actually added 14 positions. You got to do the work and you got to dig through the numbers. And that's what I did. And that's why I raised that issue. Thanks, John. Okay, uh, we're going to go now to the seventh question. Uh, what are your ideas? And this is a, sort of this has been brought up just in the previous question. What are your ideas on increasing or how we can increase the commercial tax base in Brookline? And we will start with Arden. Oh, boy. I love putting my MBA to work. <laughs> this is very a very important question. And, and, I, and I had a long conversation with my friend, Paul Sainer, who is co-chair of the Economic Development Board. But this, this is a challenge for Brookline. And I think we really have to come up with a long-term plan, as Paul said, and we need to take a look at how we can expand our commercial tax base. And of course, part of that is what happens in our, thri in our thriving, commercial corridors along our wonderful business areas. And we look along Harvard Street and all those wonderful businesses there, and we absolutely want to support them. But the problem is that we see a lot of vacant stores. And that issue is that we've had COVID for three years and people got used to shopping on Amazon. So the pro how can we support our local businesses if people are going to their computers and shopping on Amazon? And that is the key. And we really need to think about, so, so economic development, expanding our tax base does not just involve our commercial development, although we've talked about it a lot, but it also involves housing and zoning. And that's why when we talk about the MBTA Communities Act, because a lot of people are talking about it, we need to think about, we need to work with as I said before, the Department of Housing and Community Development from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts who handed down this MBTA Communities Act to us about making sure that we have this fit for Brookline and so that we can build commercial spaces on our first floor. And that not only that, we incentivize it. So businesses want to stay, thrive, and be built where people are living. And that is really the key. If you go to other communities around us, you will see that there are units, you know, just a couple of stories high, not more than four above the retail shops. And those areas tend to be thriving because then people are shopping and eating where they live instead of going on their computer and ordering from Amazon. So that is one of the things that I would like to see incentivized and included in our long-term plan for expanding our commercial tax base and increasing our economic development. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. Um, uh, actually, um, uh, vacant storefronts, according to the latest report from the planning department, are back to where they were pre-COVID. And so they're not 100%, we don't have 100% occupancy of all of our retail spaces, but there is a good story, good news story to be told here. We have an incredibly vibrant retail community in Brookline. Uh, I, I hope people don't ever take it for granted. Um, the restaurants um, are just part of it. Places like Brookline Booksmith are part of it. Coolidge Corner Theater are part of it, and key parts of it. The, the, the businesses that make Brookline special tend to be not the, the national chains. They tend to be the, the businesses that bubble up. Eureka, um, you know, the wonderful store uh, on Beacon Street at Coolidge Corner. And yes, they, they need our help thriving, but it is not necessarily a given that it's going to help them 
um, if, if we allow uh, uncontrolled development to result in demolitions of the blocks where they have their businesses, and then the next block that comes along is a block with much higher rents, or, or because they get displaced during construction, um, they, they, never, they never really can re recover. So it, it needs to be thought through um, in, in a way that recognizes the realities of what, what happens to retail operations when, when they are forced uh, to uh, move out of, their op out of their current storefronts. Do they necessarily find another storefront nearby where they can get a rent where they can thrive and survive? Um, how, are we gonna, how are we gonna take care of them if we're gonna build 1,700 more units of housing in the Harvard Street corridor. That's what the MBTA Community Act wants us to do. Um, I wanna tell you one quick story. I hope I have the time. Um, when we, there is good news. Well Tower was good news. Well Tower came about because people woke up to the reality that there was a property coming on the market um, that uh, we hadn't known about a town meeting and the day after the town meeting uh, closed, we heard about Well Tower. Re Regina Frawley and others got going. We called a town meeting. We organized uh, a vote to, um, uh, to uh, encourage that we actually pursue pur uh, purchase of uh, the property on Fisher Hill. Um, that, that Well Tower is now being built and that yielded $6 million in benefits, which are, are going into subsidized housing for people in Brookline. Um, it can happen again, but it, it doesn't happen just by saying we need to make it happen. It, it happens by sort of ca careful inventorying of the available sites and, and making them, uh, bringing the community into the process of deciding how, how we can offer a developer a good deal that is of interest to the developer and good for the town. They don't come along that often. It didn't happen at 10 Brookline Place, to my great regret, um, uh, but it might happen right soon in, in uh, Chestnut Hill West. We'll have to see. Thanks, John. Paul? Thank you, Dan. Um, you know, if, if this was an easy answer, it would have been solved by now. This has been a problem for Brookline for, for decades that um, we do not have enough commercial revenue um, and our uh, residential uh, properties take on far too much of the tax burden. The burden. Um, so the first thing that I think we need to do is we need to aggressively protect our existing retail businesses. And the thing that's in front of all of us right now is the MBTA Communities Act that does not allow Brookline mm. to require commercial on the first floor. So that does mean that we would be dependent upon developers out of the goodness of their heart to give us commercial mm. space on the first floor. So um, I, I, am, uh, I believe we need to be very aggressive about passing any zoning along, if we pass zoning along the Harvard Street corridor, with or without the support of DHCD, that we require commercial on the first floor. We cannot lose that commercial tax base. It's an asset for you as voters, and you want to hang on to it. You do not want to let it go. Um, and that's, that, that's, uh, that's very important. Um, the second thing is, I'm a business guy. I, I, I do a lot of opportunity analysis. I think we need to take a, a step back and look at where the areas of opportunity are for commercial. There's tremendous opportunity around, along Com Ave. If you ever walk down there, the sidewalk is in Boston, but those properties are in Brookline. Tremendous opportunity for commercial growth. There's uh, also uh, opportunities up um, off of Route 9 and Chestnut Hill. But guys, we, we need to decide as a community that we're going to embrace this. If we want to start to slow the growth of residential taxes, we need to support commercial development in our neighborhoods, and we have to stop saying no at every turn. The third thing that I'd, I'd like to do, this is a, a little bit of a, a longer term uh, issue, strategic issue, I'd like to engage the state reps uh, in, in this effort. Brookline has become a bedroom community to Boston and Cambridge and Somerville. They have been able to create tremendous commercial opportunities and building in their communities, but they haven't created the equal housing. So now we're being, did you know that Boston doesn't need to do, is not compliant? They don't have to follow the MBTA Communities Act or Cambridge uh, is my understanding. Um, you know, we need to talk about how, if you can ask us and demand us to create more residential housing, which by the way, does not pay for itself. 
It is not net positive on the budget. It's a net drain. Um, we need to find a way to get help from the state to help support that because Brookline should not take on the burden of housing and educating all of the commercial workers that are going into Boston and in Cambridge. So I'd like to see a more regional plan, just like housing. What's the regional plan to be able to deal with commercial revenue and a revenue sharing? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, does anybody have anything to add to that? Good, Thank okay. You. All right, we're gonna go to our last question and then we'll have conclusions after that. Um, last question is, what is your position on whether Brookline should actively investigate charter change? And we will start with John. Hey, thank you very much. <laughs> um, already, didn't you? Uh, well, in a way I did, but um, this has been, this has been a very interesting issue uh, for me. Um, at first, uh, at first it seemed obvious that uh, this would be an exciting thing to do and that we might want to, uh, you know, move towards having a, a mayor and a city form of government. And that, that we should at least talk about it and explore it. Then I got elected to the select board. I began to sort of sort of see it from the inside. And I came to appreciate town meeting, which a lot of times, you know, on the select board, we complain about all these initiatives coming at us from town meeting. But town meeting is pretty creative. It's been, it's, been, it's been amazing to me to see the measures that emerge from town meeting having to do with climate change. Um, and, and it really was through town meeting that the first measures that Brookline adopted on climate change ca came to uh, fruition. And so that speaks well for town meeting, it really does. Um, and, and the fact that you folks are here tonight, the fact that uh, we've got people on the ballot now and in every precinct that are gonna be running in for town meeting, that's, that speaks well for town meeting too. The other thing I know though is that um, I served on a select board with a chair who was a very talented woman um, and who just, got to the end of her rope because she was trying to have a career. Um, she had a good career. She was sacrificing too much. And, you know, I'll admit it, things have changed since I had my career. Um, uh, things have changed in the direction of, you know, it's every household is, is a two career household. Um, they struggle. They, str they struggle with their, their time commitments. They struggle with their commitments to their kids. To expect people in that situation to have the same amount of time that a person in my situation has as a retiree to give to town government is unrealistic. And yet, is the government going to be representative if, they are, if they're not involved to the extent that people like me are? So we got to figure out some of the strengths of our town meeting form of government, but also some of the weaknesses. And the way to do that is to set up a committee and begin to really dig into this deep. Um, do, is there a, a, an abiding faith uh, an, a, among the people in Brookline that we can continue to sort of do this ourselves as volunteers, um, or do we need to professionalize our government more by going on the path towards a city um, and either a mayor or, or a very strong, strong excuse me, uh, city manager? Um, I think it's worth um, having that conversation, and I'm gonna do what I can to uh, push it forward uh, in my next term. He said confidently. <laughs> John. Paul. Sure. Um, if you are one of my 98 followers on Twitter, I think I'm now up to 107, by the way. I'm, I'm really rocking and rolling. <laughs> keep, um, yeah. keep working at it. Go ahead, John. Um, you know, you, you would know that I support um, an investigation of our charter. Um, I have uh, a lot of friends in Brookline uh, and Brookline politics. Um, I respect the individuals that absolutely are dedicated to what they consider the purest form of gov democracy, which is town meeting. I also have tremendous respect for individuals um, that, you know, have believe that there's a more efficient and effective way for us to be able to manage a municipality of approaching 65,000 people. Um, so I, this is what I support. There's two ways to do charter change, um, investigate a charter. The select board could appoint a committee uh, that committee could come up with a charter uh, proposal. It would have to go through town meeting. Town meeting is not going to vote itself out of a job, folks. I guarantee you. It. <laughs> so the other option is um, it has to be a ballot question. So one of you in the audience there, or several of you, need to go gather, uh, I think it's 7,000 signatures uh, or 8,000 signatures uh, to put the question on the ballot. And a lot of those signatures have already been gathered by an amazing group of young 
folks in town, uh, 18, 19, 20 year olds that started this process. Um, and then the, the, the question would go on the ballot and you would get to choose, do you wanna investigate changing our form of government? And on that same ballot, you would get to vote for the charter commission, not appointed a committee appointed by the select board, but that you get to choose. And then they would come back, I think it's either uh, 12 or 14 months later, and they would make a proposal to you for a form of government. I don't know if town meeting is the right way or the wrong way, or if city's the right way or the wrong way. Um, it could be what John said, a strong mayor, or a weak mayor, or a strong, a strong town manager. Um, but I do believe that it's worth it for us to ask this question and investigate it. We do owe it to uh, the people that are following behind us. Thank you. I'm sorry, Dan, I went over. That's all right. Thanks, mm. Paul. Arden. Yes. No, I'm kidding. I, I say. no I, I, I completely agree with what the two of them said. So this is a great question to end on because I, I absolutely think that we are all in agreement. But I do want to say that mm -hmm. I am so impressed with what I would call civilian government. Town meeting, we are the oldest form of democracy, town meeting here in New England. It only exists in New England. And our representative town meeting is really impressive. And I can see why it has lasted as long as it has, because it is a success story here in Brookline. However, I am not resistant to change and change is always good. So I do believe that as, as Paul and John said, that absolutely on the select board, we need to appoint a committee. We have wonderful boards and committees. So, one of, so many of them here in Brookline. I love how now that we have open gov, I can actually see all the committees and boards that we have here in Brookline. And now that I've been involved in town meeting and running for candidate for select board, I can actually meet all of you on the committees and boards. And I think it's just an incredible experience to be a part of, but I absolutely think that we need to appoint a committee, yet another one here on the select board through the select board and make sure it's very representative of all of you and take a look at whether charter is the right direction for Brookline. Thank you. Thanks, Arden. Um, so we're going to move on now to concluding remarks. We're going to start with Paul and you have three minutes. I'm not going to use the three minutes. It's been a long night. Um, <laughs> I don't know about you. You must be getting tired of listening to us. I am. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, the other candidates, uh, John, for his service uh, to our community for the past three years. Uh, I also know uh, his long service on the advisory committee and his long service in town meeting. Um, so whatever the outcome is, John, I appreciate your service to our town. Arden, um, I appreciate you jumping in. Uh, with your enthusiasm, um, I, I, and I appreciate your collaboration, um, and to uh, the, the BNA for putting on this forum. I think it's important for all of you joining us. Um, that's the politician speaking. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But I do want to say this. I, I'm, I'm a pretty pragmatic individual um, and, and straightforward. I do think that I bring something unique uh, to the select board. Um, as I said earlier, I've got 30 years of uh, high and high level executive experiencing experience, managing public companies, managing large organization, managing budgets, and more importantly, managing like responsive operations, having customer service has to actually answer the phone. I know how to do that. Um, you know, my life journey is unique. Um, I don't know if I don't know anybody's individual story, but I do believe having someone on the select board that has lived in income restricted housing, something that we need in Brookline. Um, I think that's a lens uh, that I can provide a unique perspective on, on the select board. I don't think we've had that. Uh, if we have, it hasn't been for a long time. Um, uh, you know, I do know how our government works. I've been in it. I've been in the weeds of it at the, at the advisory committee with John um, in town meeting. I've, I've gone, ran the gauntlet many times of, of bringing warrant articles, complex and controversial warrant articles. I usually don't take on things that are easy, as many of you know. Um, and the only reason why I've been effective is because I know how to compromise. I really believe that the progress for Brookline isn't by one interest group or the other. It's the space in between the groups where the common ground exists. That's where progress is made. And I'm really good at that. Um, and then finally, um, I would say that being a parent, um, I, would, uh, I would welcome the opportunity to join Miriam as a parent. Miriam also has children in the school system. I think it's important to have people in our executive office have experiences that are representative of the rest of the town. 
I don't have I, all the experiences, but I do think I believe I bring a unique perspective. So I ask for your vote on May 2nd, and it would be my honor to serve you on the select board. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. John? I want to thank Paul, and I want to thank Arden. I, I hope you out there agree that this has been kind of fun. This has been a spirited uh, evening, and I think that's all to the good. Uh, but I do want to say that um, I probably annoyed some of you in the audience tonight. I have a way of doing that. Um, you know, when you take, um, I'll call them contrarian positions on issues that everybody wants to say, um, oh, that's already been decided. Didn't you know? Um, oh, nobody agrees with you. Didn't you know? Um, in, all, in all modesty, um, I, I, I just want to say, I, I think... I think the town needs me on the select board because without the voice that occasionally says, are we sure we're right on this? Are we sure that it's the right thing to do? Um, decisions can get made that are not the best for the town. And I'm going to cite an example, which is from my experience that was the year before I ran for the select board. Uh, the consensus was the decision had been made. We were gonna do the Driscoll School and build a new school at the Baldwin site. And everybody knew that was the only way to do it because they'd been working on the planning of this for years and years and years. And all that is true. But what was also true was that they lost sight of something. They lost sight of the tradition of, of walkable schools in Brookline. Um, and because they faced difficult options, they made a decision that was unlike any other decision that had ever been made about, about locating a new school in Brookline, um, to, to locate it where the students weren't instead of where the students were. And so it took some people who thought differently and who weren't afraid to sort of go against the grain to say, is this really the right thing for Brookline? Is this really the right decision for Brookline? And one thing led to another and it went on the ballot and even the people, and I was one of them in the campaign to tell people, don't vote for this. We can come up with a better plan. Even we didn't think that the voters would agree with us, but they agreed with us substanti in substantial number. It wasn't even close, really. Um, and that's an example of, uh, that, that's, that saved the town about $90 million on a school that wouldn't have been the right place at the right time and wasn't, as it turns out, wasn't needed for different reasons because of COVID. Um, but you, you need people who are going to every now and then represent the other point of view on issues. And often I'm with the consensus, but often I'm the only one who's, who's raising questions from the other pers perspective. And yes, I admit, um, I might occasionally be wrong, but the person who disagrees with you might occasionally be right. And we need that dialogue to continue um, across every issue, uh, and, and I think we need to, that dialogue to continue for the next three years, and that's why I, um, as I said, humbly, humbly ask for your vote. But thank you very much for listening, listening to me tonight. Thanks, John. Arden? Thank you. I will try to be succinct. First, I want to say thank you, Gina. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, all of you in the audience. I really appreciate it. Now I'm going to let you get on with your evenings. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, John, for both of you for all of your service. Here we go. If you elect me to the select board, here's what I will accomplish. A broader tax base and additional sources to increase revenues and decrease our structural deficit. Efficiencies in our departments and prudent fiscal oversight. Proactive climate policy to reach our sustainability goals. Support for our schools and unwavering attention to their impact on our community as a whole. Evaluating our town school partnership and ensuring that all stakeholders' interests are met. And last but not least, problem solving our affordability crisis through careful, detailed evaluation of our housing and business models and how we can create municipal policies that foster a sustainable financial future for Brookline. And I will accomplish this as your leader on the executive board in a respectful, cohesive, and goal-oriented way. On May 2nd, we the voters of Brookline have a decision to make. I got in this race so that you could have a choice for the select board. 
Without me, the election would have remained uncontested for the second year in a row. I will be a leader who can make executive decisions that support business growth, equitable schools, and proactive policies. But more importantly, will bring Brookline in the, into the direction that you want. So if you are ready for a change, then vote for me, Arden Reamer, on May 2nd, and I will get to work for you. Okay, thank you, Arden. Uh, so just a couple of quick con concluding remarks. I want to thank uh, Devin Fields at the town who secured this room for us, which was really important. We're, uh, we appreciate that. I want to thank Lee for the timekeeping. Great job, Lee. Uh, and Linda and Gina for helping organize this night. I want to thank Big for streaming this and uh, putting it on, on YouTube, and everyone's going to be able to watch it over the next few days and, and upcoming weeks. Uh, and thanks to everybody for coming out. This is the first event, like we said, that we've done like this in three years, and it's great to have an audience here. Fantastic. Um, but the biggest thanks is really to the three people up here. This was a great conversation, uh, just intelligent, informed uh, people talking about the issues that matter to us. And uh, I think it was fantastic. I really appreciate all your thoughts on everything. Thanks. Dan, can I just interrupt? With Lee, I forgot to thank you. And I just want to say thank you so much for timekeeping. Sorry about that. All right. And everybody, please go out and vote on Tuesday, May 2nd. Thank you. Thank you. Or, for coming. or before. Or before. Or before. <laughs> or before. <laughs> or before. <laughs> Nice, 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 nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was good. That was good. That was good. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Alex, you want to Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> has has Black and Brown Club figured out yeah. when they wanted to do that thing on the 29th?